pleasure to invite Bram Siegel to come and talk. He qualified uh, 20 years later than Rick and I, so he's an exceedingly young man. Uh, Albert Einstein College of New York, and then he did residences in Tufts and ID training at the National Institutes of Health in the USA. And then he had experience with primary immunodeficiencies, predominantly, especially uh, chronic granulomatous disease. He's working currently at a cancer center with immunocompromised patients. So there's a lot of interaction between the management of different kinds of, of um, infections, aspergillus, if you like. And his research is into um, something really very technical to do with uh, NADP oxidase and how it mediates host defense. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. It, it is a pleasure to be here. So we're, my, my topic is aspergillosis and CGD. Uh, what is CGD? So CGD is chronic granulomatous disease, okay? What is a granuloma? A granuloma is a well-defined area of inflammation. So when this disease was defined in the 1950s, one of the hallmarks was inflammation. Another hallmark was infection. So this is a case of aspergillosis in a CGD patient. Uh, this is a CAT scan, so here would be normal lung, and this mass that you see over here, it's not projecting very well, is basically fungal pneumonia. And when we look at uh, fluid that was removed uh, from the pleura, so that's the area that's surrounding the lung, what you see over here, I'm gonna try to draw it out just a little, well, the light is not uh, projecting very well, but there's this thin aspergillus hypha over here. So it's a long uh, string, uh, it looks like a long string basically. And surrounding it are all, the blue things are all these neutrophils, okay? And what's happening, what I'm trying to, uh, the message I'm trying to give you is that these neutrophils, which are the major white cells that are involved in fighting aspergillus, they're able to surround the aspergillus hyphae, but they're not able to damage it, okay? Now, when we look at invasive aspergillosis, what does it look like in the tissue, okay? That's gonna depend on the patient, okay? So invasive aspergillosis, invasive means it's inside tissue, normally the lung. The way it's going to look the, uh, is going to depend on, on, on the patient-related factors. Now, I did cheat a little bit because here I'm not showing you a chronic granulomatous disease patient. I'm showing you a knockout mouse model of chronic granulomatous disease where, we, where one of the genes that makes the NADPH oxidase has been, uh, has been damaged. So when we give aspergillus uh, to a CGD mouse, we have a characteristic inflammatory response, I'm sorry, in the, uh, in the lungs. So what the blue stuff here is all inflammation. And what you could see in the lower panel, those black structures are hyphae that go into the lung, okay? If I gave this to a normal mouse, in fact, even if I gave a thousand-fold higher, uh, the normal mouse would easily clear the infection. But what we see histologically, or histologically means when we look at the tissue under the microscope, is a bunch of inflammation that's surrounding the aspergillus hyphae, but not able to adequately kill the aspergillus. But one thing that's interesting is in uh, CGD patients, the as when pneumonia occurs, the aspergillus usually does not go into blood vessels, whereas in other patients that are highly immunocompromised, such as people getting cancer chemotherapy, in which a chemotherapy uh, wipes out the neutrophils, there you often see uh, the aspergillus actually going into the blood vessels. What, is an, what are the other manifestations of CGD? So there's excessive inflammation. So this is... Um, here I'm, trying to, I'm showing you a CAT scan where we have the bladder that's abnormally thickened. And sometimes in CGD, there can be obstruction of the genitourinary tract, the genitourinary tract being the kidney, the ureters, and the bladder. 
Here we see, I, th I think e you can see this is an esophagus from a CGD patient. That's the food pipe. You can see that it's abnormal with uh, kinks and obstructions. About a third of CGD patients have inflammatory bowel disease that resembles Crohn's disease. So we had mentioned the NADPH oxidase. So CGD, or chronic granulomatous disease, results from genetic mutations in components of the NADPH oxidase. What does NADPH oxidase do? It takes oxygen and it converts it into reactive oxidants, which are unstable molecules that have the ability to then, that have antimicrobial activity. They're able to uh, destroy bacteria and fungi. In addition, uh, the NADPH oxidase also activates proteases. What are proteases? Proteases are enzymes that degrade proteins. And these proteases, all, all, some of them also have antimicrobial activity. Now, invasive fungal infections in CGD. This is amongst the highest causes of morbidity and uh, mortality in CGD. It's estimated that about 0.1 fungal infections per patient year occur. There are different kinds of CGD, um, and there may be some different uh, level, some, some levels of increased susceptibility with one form versus another. Now, in terms of uh, aspergillosis, um, this is actually a general comment about CGD patients. When they get infection, they often don't have obvious signs of infection. So there can be a pneumonia, either bacterial or fungal, without a high fever and sometimes with no fever at all. The findings can be quite nonspecific, which is why you have to have a high uh, level of vigilance. So, for example, in a review of aspergillosis in CGD patients at the National Institutes of Health, about a third were without symptoms, that's asymptomatic, and only about 20% had fever. In contrast to other people, when you have a pneumonia, let's say a walking pneumonia, you know it. You have fever, cough, shortness of breath, you're feeling acutely ill. Often that's lacking in CGD. Uh, there was a large published uh, European experience of uh, of, of uh, 429 European patients with CGD. And there were the usual range of bacterial and fungal pathogens. CGD patients are not at risk for all infections, but only a subset of infections. Certain bacteria, and, 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 as well as fungal infections, being a very important cause of uh, very important complications. So aspergillus uh, was amongst the most frequent uh, infections. There are 111 uh, uh, cases of aspergillosis, uh, and it was the most common cause of pneumonia. Now, why am I showing you this slide? So um, this is in, in, at Roswell Park Cancer Institute where I work. We don't have CGD patients. We have, we have one that I take care of, but it's a very rare disease. We have immunocompromised patients with cancer, such as transplant recipients. They're in protected wards where we try to reduce the fungal exposure, right? Through HEPA filtration, through uh, having the pressure in place where the patient's room, is, uh, the, the pressure is positive relative to the outside so that the air is exhausted outside. Sometimes, uh, not routinely, but sometimes we'll do monitoring for fungi. And what, what we did is, just for illustration for the medical students, is we sampled uh, fungal growth in a non protected area. So this could just as easily have been here just to show that these fungi are quite ubiquitous, meaning that they're, they're present all over and we inhale them on a regular basis. Now this is a review paper that I had written where I try to show a cartoon where you have different forms of the fungus. The spores are called conidia, right? So that's sort of the dormant stage. And then they start to grow a little bit. In the right environment, they'll start to grow. And just uh, in the test tube, within about six or seven hours, they'll start to sprout. And we call those germlings. And then they get bigger with, in the right environment. And that's called the hyphal stage. And the hyphal stage is what goes into tissue, okay? 
And our immune system has the ability to sense microbial products that are displayed on the conidia, on the germlings, and on the hyphae. And if you think of it from an evolutionary standpoint, the molds have existed for about a billion years. So they came way before us. And animals, including human animals, but also insects, uh, different uh, other mammals, we all have the ability, we, we all need to have the ability to sense fungal products, right? In fact, even in fruit flies that have certain deficiencies, they become more susceptible to aspergillus. So even the fruit fly or Drosophila has innate host defense, again, has, has host defense against aspergillus. In mammals, uh, we will sense different microbial products. And again, what we want to do when we inhale fungus is we want to kill it, right? But we don't want to have too much inflammation because if there was inflammation that occurred, especially if there was persistent inflammation like occurs in ABPA, that's, a that, that's obviously a disease unto itself. Oh, thank you very much. So the trick is we have to inhale it, but, but, it should, we, we, but we also have to be able to destroy the inhaled fungus without creating a last, without it creating a lasting, a lasting inflammatory imprint. So there's a lot of investment at the genetic level into pathogen recognition receptors that sense the microbial product, that, that sense different constituents on aspergillus that enable us, our immune system to kill or clear the aspergillus, but to minimize the inflammatory response. Now, one of the things that occur is through Dectin-1, which is one of these microbial, uh, what's called pathogen recognition receptors, when it, sends, it will sense a specific cell wall, constituent, cell wall constituent found on fungi, and it will stimulate NADPH oxidase. So that's where you have the respiratory, with NADPH oxidase, that's where you have the respiratory burst, where oxygen is converted to superoxide, anion to other reactive oxidants. And that, in the NADPH oxidase is critical in host defense against aspergillosis. So with CGD, you have a defect in the NADPH oxidase, and that leaves you at high risk for aspergillus and other mold infections, like we see over here. But something that's interesting in, in aspergillosis, so this is a slide I borrowed from Dr. Denning that kind of goes through how the immune system uh, governs response to aspergillus and different diseases are associated with aspergillus. So acute IA, I st IA stands for invasive aspergillosis. Who gets that? Highly immunocompromised patients. So invasive aspergillus means the aspergillus has gone into the lung or into other organs. Who, who's at risk? People with leukemia getting very potent chemotherapy. Lung transplant recipients stem cell transplant recipients, right? These are the highly immunocompromised people. And in that group, we include CGD, okay? With CGD, there are normal neutrophil counts, but the neutrophils don't work because of the NADPH oxidase deficiency. At the other end of the spectrum, we have too much inflammation. So this is what Dr. Moss's topic was, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, where we don't have invasive disease, there's rather persistent hyphae that, that exist in the airways, and that is evoking an inflammatory response. CGD is also a disease of too much inflammation, right? So aspergillosis, on the one hand, in CGD is an invasive, life-threatening disease, but also, as we're learning from the mouse models, it also represents a disease of excessive inflammation. Here's an example from patients. This is a recently described entity called mulch pneumonitis. So this is from the NIH. And I recall one patient who actually was included in this series. What did he do? He's a CGD patient, and he was uh, shoveling a truck with a lot of contaminated products. He came into the hospital filled with a really bad pneumonia, very, very aggressive pneumonia that basically took up the entire lung. He was treated with antifungal agents plus steroids. 
right? Normally, we don't use steroids for invasive aspergillosis because steroids decrease uh, immunity. But here, it was needed to quiet down the immune system. And with mulch pneumonitis, uh, again, it, it's not a well-defined entity, but the treatment would involve both antifungal agents to control the fungal infections and steroids to suppress the inflammation. What does it look like? So radiographically, this is not quite a normal lung, but close to normal lung. This is after treatment. All this white stuff here on the chest X-ray and CAT scan, that's all inflammation. That's all a diffuse pneumonia. So this patient would not be able to breathe without oxygen, probably needed to be on a ventilator. But with antifungal ther therapy and steroids, we see a clearing of the disease. What, are, what is the current therapy for CGD? Well, you need to be on antibacterial prophylaxis because of our range of bacterial infections. You should be on antifungal prophylaxis. Itraconazole is standard, but other agents can be used as well. Recombinant uh, gamma interferon. So gamma interferon is a chemical. Uh, it's actually a naturally produced product that augments uh, the function of neutrophils and macrophages. When infection occurs, you need prolonged courses of therapy. And white cell transfusions are sometimes used for severe infections. What is the rationale for white cell transfusions? I already mentioned that their circulating white count is fine. The notion would be that the, that the NADPH oxidase in the normal transfused neutrophils can diffuse outside and, and restore some of the capacity of the CGD neutrophils to function. We have a number of antifungal drugs that are used. Uh, the azoles are quite uh, commonly used. Itraconazole, as, as, uh, as I'm listing, itraconazole, voriconazole, and posaconazole. There was a few studies with itraconazole, one of which um, uh, was a comparative study that showed that itraconazole can be useful in preventing aspergillus and CGD. Uh, Voriconazole has also been used in pediatric patients, uh, including most of these were leukemia or transplant patients, but some were CGD, so we have some experience uh, there. Uh, and then uh, we were involved in a small study in patients with CGD with invasive mold infections that were refractory to, anti to standard antifungals. Uh, th this was done at the NIH. Um, and uh, posaconazole therapy was successful in a number of these patients. Gamma interferon, so what does that do? It activates white cells. And in a stu study that's almost 20 years old, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, it was a randomized comparative study. So you, you compared interferon gamma with a placebo. And what the results were that there was a redu reduced frequency of bacterial, severe bacterial infections by about two-thirds. Inter so interferon gamma became a standard of care, still is. It has a long-term safety record that, that is quite good. Uh, it's injected three times a week. Sometimes there could be some mild fever-type symptoms or fatigue, but generally it's well tolerated and used together with antibacterial and antifungal prophylaxis. What can you do to, pre to prevent uh, aspergillosis and CGD? Um, well, you should be using antifungal prophylaxis unless there's a contraindication. Uh, th that would be the, the, the obvious way. You have to be aware of where mold spores are likely to be highest. Right? The molds typically grow on decaying uh, vegetation or other organic material, so you want to avoid gardening, you want to avoid mulching, things of that nature. That being said, CGD uh, children and adults have to live normal lives, right? Uh, unlike uh, patients who, let's say, have leukemia, who for the short period of time that they receive chemotherapy can be in a HEPA-filtered hospital ward, CGD patients have to go to school, go to camp, get on with their lives. So it's always a balance in trying to reduce the exposure using common sense approaches, but also you have to live your life as well. Stem cell transplantation. So this is, CGD is a disorder of stem cells. Uh, bone marrow transplantation will be curative if it works. In other words, you take 
a donor who doesn't have CGD, uh, the CGD patient uh, undergoes a regimen to purge his or her marrow, and then the donor cells from the, the normal donor cells uh, are then administered intravenously, uh, and, and then, um, the, in essence, the donor-derived immune system takes over. It's curative if it works, but one of the problems, uh, and this applies to all trans stem cell transplants, not just for CGD, is that transplantation is a big, big, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a therapy that is fraught with complications. Uh, there can be substantial transplant-related mortality. The transplant itself is immunosuppressive and there could be substantial complications. Probably it's best if you have a donor uh, in which they're genetically similar to the CGD patient but have an intact NADPH oxase, obviously. So a sibling donor that has a good match would ha w is likely to uh, have the least uh, level of, of post-transplant complications. Now, gene therapy, uh, CGD is actually an ideal disease for gene therapy. Why? It's a disease of the stem cell. Uh, the genes are all well-defined. In mouse models, uh, gene therapy has been quite uh, effective. Also in CGD, you, you need a relatively small proportion of functional uh, NADPH oxase competent neutrophils to ultimately protect the person. This is not unique to CGD, but one of the problems with gene therapy is to maintain a stable population of gene-corrected cells. And there has been advances in the field uh, it's still at a, very much at a research level, but uh, I would expect over the next several years that there will be continued uh, advances made in, in gene therapy. And CGD, again, might be a very idea, might be, uh, in essence, a, you know, no disease is good, but in terms of gene therapy, it has the requisites where it could be quite promising if the gene therapy field uh, advances well and some of the problems that are generic to gene therapy uh, uh, can be addressed. So that is my last slide. I'd be delighted to take any questions. Thank you very much. So are there any questions then about this aspergillus in chronic granulomatous disease? How do you see the analogy with cystic fibrosis? There are two diseases with single gene abnormalities. They manifest in quite different ways, don't they? Mm -hmm. It is, and I think um, with cystic fibrosis, um, the problem is not at the level of the white cells, right? It's not, uh, it's not what I'd call an immunodeficiency. Probably what's going on with cystic fibrosis Dr. Moss would be the expert, but in, in essence, there's persistent lung damage. And there's bronchiectasis, what is bronchiectasis? That means an enlarging and a, de 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 def and a deformation of the airways. And that sets up an environment where aspergillus can colonize. Also in CF patients, there seems to be an allergic type manifestations as well that may also lead to persistence of aspergillus and, uh, and also e e evoke the inflammatory responses that characterize ABPA. In CGD, the issue is that the white cells don't function, right? The, the neutrophils do not function properly. So uh, whereas in CF, aspergillus is mostly a disease of the airways and causes inflammation and plugging, in CGD, it actually goes into the lung, right? It's actually in the tissue itself, creating invasive disease. So I think that's where I would say the major uh, distinction would be. Rick, thank you. In, um, you mentioned white cell transfusions for CGD. Um, what particular situations would you find most applicable and how long an effect and how frequently do you need to do it if you do use that modality? Yeah, you see, one, white cell 
if you ask a, a, a board question, right? You, you're, let's say you want to examine a physician and say, under what situations have white cell transfusions been shown to be beneficial? And the answer is none. Uh, it may be that the studies that were done were quite old. We have better methods now to collect white cells, right? So you, ha you can actually transfuse more white cells. Typically, when white cell transfusions are used, they're used in people with profound neutropenia, which means low neutrophil count from chemotherapy. And they develop an infection. You try to buy them time with transfused white cells until their own white cell count can recover. In CGD, the rationale for the white cell transfusions, it's a relatively reasonable rationale because you can show in the test tube that if you take some normal white cells and you take CGD white cells, you can actually make the CGD white cells function better by commingling them with the normal neutrophils. That said, the, the data to support white cell transfusions is observational, meaning it has not been subjected to a, a trial where we could really evaluate its benefit. It's reserved for significant infections, in other words, where we feel we might lose the patient. So that could be bacterial or fungal. And it would be given, in, in, the, in the cancer patients without neutrophil count, uh, you stop the neutrophil transfusions when their own neutrophil count comes back. That's easy. In CGD patients, we don't, it's, it's, it's a qualitative, not a quantitative problem. So you would stop once there's control of infection or, 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 tox, or, or if there's untoward toxicity. Uh, in, in which you, you're in, in which the white cells are more harmful than helpful. Any other immediate questions? I, there's one question here. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Marlene Micheloni, and I'm a representative of the Italian uh, Chief Patient Association, and. Uh, I want to ask you, because you were speaking about the necessity of having a normal life, so <clears throat> what about the, the risk uh, for the CF patients but other patients also uh, to have domestic uh, animals in house? To, uh, does it increase a lot the risk of uh, aspergillosis infection or not? I could so ask you, both you, of you. You're asking in terms of CF? For, or? Uh, yes, I, I was thinking about CF before, but uh, as you spoke about normal life and so on, there is to have that. Uh, I think, I think pe pe people may have uh, differences uh, uh, of opinion. I know that in the cancer setting, which is not exactly the question you, you, you're asking, um, let's say someone is undergoing chemotherapy or stem cell transplant, you know, that would not be the time to buy a new pet, but if they had a, if they had a pet to start with, we certainly do not uh, advise them to, to, to get rid of the pet. Uh, you would not be wanting to change, you, you know, if it's a cat, let's say, you would not be going, uh, you would not be changing the kitty box. Uh, you would not, you would, you would do your best to try to uh, minimize uh, your exposure to mold. So if the pet is outside, let's say going through leaves or, 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 or things of that nature, you don't want to be in that setting. I'd say in the CGD patient, uh, my, my own sense is that they don't need to be restricted from having a pet. That's a part of growing up also, but you want to ask yourself, where is mold exposure most likely to occur? Okay, and then to try to restrict that. I have uh, one question. Um, do you think that uh, in a CGT patient, is it also um, just one event and an invasive aspergillosis or a kind of colonization? And at a certain point, there's an imbalance and then the patient has an invasive uh, aspergillosis. I'm sorry, an imbalance? An imbalance. Is it also like a CF patient? Is it a colonization and then would yeah. Another infection. Well, you could say, uh, e correct. So you could say in, in, in all situations of aspergillosis, colonization has to precede invasion. But I think there's an important difference with the CF patients, because in essence, with CF, there's persistent, or with ABPA in general and CF specifically, there's a persistent airway colonization. 
with aspergillus. With CGD patients, I don't think that occurs. I think it's, it's not that there's a persistent colonization, it's more of an acute fungal pneumonia. Uh, certainly with the animal models, and again, when we talk in CGD patients, you, you can't get a precise time course. In other words, you diagnose a lesion when you see it radiographically, a nodule or an infiltrate or something of that nature. You can't look back in time and say, well, how long were they colonized and how long did it take for invasion to occur? In the animal, uh, in the mouse models that we use with CGD, uh, within a couple of days of experimental challenge, we see fungal pneumonia. So. My sense is that in that way it's dissimilar. We don't have a system of persistent colonization. Uh, there may be an early colonization followed by invasive fungal pneumonia. Uh, 